شكراً لسعادة السادة المحاضرين على هذا العرض الجيد ويشرني أن أدعو سعادة مسعود بدري لإدارة فعاليات الجلسة الثانية كما أدعو سعادة الدكتور جورج بيرنيه وسعادة الدكتورة فاليريا روشا فليتفضلوا مشكورين السلام عليكم Uh, it gives me great pleasure here to, uh, to welcome two distinguished guests. I was told that I have uh, only an hour here, so we will cut short the presentations too. And if I read what's written about them, it will take me all day. Okay, so uh, I, 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 the, the, the Dr. Bernay, I, we have uh, uh, Dr. Rocha. Okay, so it's not the way it's written, and I will uh, ask any one of them who wants to start uh, their presentation. I'm afraid that's the extent of my Arabic, so you have to bear with me uh, in English. So welcome to this gender gap uh, presentation. And uh, because uh, we are sort of running short on time here, I'd like to start uh, by presenting some data uh, that was published by the Global Gender G uh, Gap Report in 2016, in that they create a gender index to assess uh, gender equity uh, in educational attainment, health survival, and economic participation. And they do that in 144 countries. Um, and here we are highlighting the GCC countries and how they do on those indexes. And we can see here that in educational attainment and health and survival, these countries are doing very well. Actually, the, the equity index ranges from zero to one. Zero meaning no equity, one meaning total equity. And they are all very close uh, to one. In fact, the UAE uh, has already reached um, one, right? However, here in the economic participation, the indexes are not so high to improve. Um, of course, we are happy that the gender um, uh, equity on education is high. Um, and we know the benefits of education, right? We can talk about the better overall health and well-being uh, that people experience with each uh, level of education. Um, the less stereotyped and prejudiced judgments, right? So this actually makes for people to relate better to others, not just at work, but in their personal lives. Um, they also show uh, better efficiency on the job. Even when they don't know a skill, they learn a skill faster when they have a higher level of education. And also higher financial returns. So there have been some studies done in Kuwait, Qatar, and the UAE that actually show higher financial returns for males than females and for the private sector than the public sector. The issue then becomes um, the low performance of males in school and the low participation of women uh, in the labor force, right? Because we know that particularly in male-dominated societies, uh, less educated males tend to actually have views that are more strict uh, with regards to gender, right? And this um, ends up leading to more difficulties in the workplace. First, and if there is the issue of accepting females in the workplace, and the fact that people with more gender stereotypical views might resent uh, females in position of leadership. So what we want to do in this presentation is basically see um, where are the GCC countries with regards to the gender gap. So first, to determine the overall trends in achievement. Are they improving um, or not over time? Determine the magnitude and the trend of the gender gap. So is there really a gender gap in every country for each, for each assessment cycle? And is the gender gap increasing or decreasing over time? Then we wanted to investigate some of the factors associated with the gender gap uh, in males and females' achievement. 
and then hopefully propose some policies. So before I start talking about GGCC, I just wanted to uh, give you an overview of the gender gap in top performing countries, okay? So we can see at the top, we have Tim's uh, science and Tim's math, and we see that in science, in most countries, there is no significant differences between males and females. That's represented by the X in each uh, cell. And when there is uh, a difference, males are actually performing higher. That's the case in Korea and Hong Kong. In math, we see a similar pattern, with the exception of Singapore, in that females outperform males uh, in eighth grade. And then with PISA, we see a different pattern, because here we are looking at reading. And as we know, women tend to perform better than men in reading. And that happens across all the top five uh, performing countries. In science, um, we do uh, see that uh, some males perform higher. Uh, and here we see that, for example, in Macau, uh, females perform are better in math. Uh, the same in Finland. Um, and as I said, in Ireland and Canada, we are assessing reading, so they are doing better uh, in general. Okay. Here we are talking about six countries, too many graphs. So I would like you to ask you to focus on a few aspects of these graphs. First, the direction of the lines. So are the lines going up? Are they going down? The color of the lines. So basically, the red color represents female scores. The blue color represents male scores, right? And also, pay attention to the little asterisk above the scores, okay? When you see an asterisk, it means that the difference between uh, boys' and girls' scores are statistically significant, okay? And finally, let's take a look at the distance between the lines. So when you see a big distance, it normally means a larger difference between boys' and girls' scores. So here we are looking at Tim's fourth grade science scores, so most lines are going up. Uh, we can see that the red line is always above the blue line, so girls are uh, performing higher than boys. But also notice that there are not asterisks in every graph, right? So if you look at Kuwait, for example, yes, they are performing better, but that difference is not statistically significant. For eighth grade, we see a similar pattern, the uh, most lines going up, uh, the red line above the blue line, so girls are scoring higher than boys, but not all differences are um, significant here. And in math, we see the same, girls performing higher than boys. But see, the number of uh, little stars, the asterisks, is going down, which means, yes, they are performing higher, but now, the, the, there's no statistically significance in more countries than in actually we saw in science. And also note that the distance between the lines is decreasing, right? So the difference between girls and boys' scores are decreasing. And we see the same thing here for um, eighth grade math, the same uh, kind of pattern. The distance between the lines also smaller than we saw um, previously in science. In PISA, there are only two countries participating in PISA, so uh, the UAE and Qatar. And it's not uh, that, difference, right? that different in the sense that females are outperforming um, males. Uh, the distance, particularly in the UAE in reading, is uh, pretty large. But uh, again, three um, out of six countries show differences that are not statistically significant, okay? So what are these graphs telling us? What are the general trends that we are observing? Well, first, that there is an improvement in international assessments in general, for the most part, in most countries. Girls score higher than boys in all subjects and in all grades. However, those differences are not always statistically significant, which means they could have happened by chance, right? 
There are larger significant gender gaps in science than in math, especially in eighth grade. And we can see that by looking at uh, the significance levels uh, between the differences in boys' and girls' scores. So we see that in Tim's fourth and eighth grade science, the differences are significant in five out of six countries. Fourth grade math, four out of six countries. And eighth grade math, it's significant just in three out of six countries, okay? And in PISA, there are significant gaps in math, reading, and science in Qatar, but in the UAE, the gap in math is actually not significant. So is the gender gap increasing or it is decreasing in GCC countries? So here, we see a lot of arrows pointing down, some arrows pointing up, um, and I just want to bring your attention to the colors. I, I made, uh, I've been using two different colors to sort of, um, uh, for you to pay attention to these uh, details. So when you see this pink color, it means that the, the gender gap is decreasing significantly, okay? So that's the difference between the two last assessment cycles. Um, and you see the gray color boxes, they show actually uh, statistically significant increases in the gender gap. So overall, uh, we can see a lot of arrows pointing down and some arrows pointing up. So that might be indicative of a, of a trend, and we'll see next assessment cycles how this is going uh, to play out. Okay. Here we looked um, at the variation of the gender gap by schools. So. Um, we are talking about high SES schools that are defined as schools that have less than 25% uh, disadvantaged students, and low SES schools that have 25% or more of disadvantaged students. And these boxes represent the point differences in scores between uh, males and females. Okay, so we see, for example, uh, that in Bahrain, the difference between boys' and girls' scores in high SES schools is smaller than in low SES schools, right? And we see um, across the graph three different patterns, actually. If we look, for example, at Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, we see that the difference between boys' and girls' scores is higher in low SES schools. But if you look at, for example, Kuwait and Qatar, it's the opposite. The difference is actually uh, larger in high SES schools. And then there's a third pattern in Oman and in the UAE that they are about the same, okay? And I'm gonna skip these two slides, but they show basically the same pattern for Tim's fourth grade and for PISA, okay? So here, we are looking at the association between gender of students, gender of teachers, and their attitudes and opinions about schools. And we'll be focusing from now on on results for Tim's eighth grade, the science uh, the scores. So the first column in yellow basically uh, tells you about the association between the gender of the student and the gender of teacher. So, uh, for example, uh, you can see the, the coefficients are pretty high, indicating that most females have female teachers, okay? And uh, it's also true that males have more male teachers. Male students have more male teachers. But you can see the coefficients are uh, pretty di uh, different, and they vary quite a bit. So we can see, for example, in Saudi Arabia, Almost every girl has a female teacher. Um, and also you see pretty high coefficients for Oman, Kuwait, and Bahrain. In Qatar, in the UAE, it's more mixed, right? You have um, more females that have male teachers and um, male students who have uh, female teachers. Um, and then, again, I'm gonna ask you to focus on the colors. Um, 
So this uh, pink for female and, and uh, blue for male. And we can say, when we, by looking at these uh, color codes here, that there is an association between being a female student and wanting to pursue tertiary education, okay? So females tend to agree more, more with the statement, yes, I want to go beyond high school. This is in all countries, okay? We also see the same pattern uh, about feeling safe in schools, um, having extra lessons four or more months a year, so females tend to uh, agree with that. Um, confidence in science and high sense of belonging in school. Now, you notice the coefficients are not very high, but I think they are indicative of a pattern, right? And at the same time, when we look at the blue color, we see um, some behaviors that are not associated with high performance in school. And unfortunately, um, you know, they are predominantly um, associated with males' responses. So with regards to absence from school, it's actually more of a mix, right? So um, some uh, in Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain actually males tend um, to agree more with that statement, but in Kuwait and Oman, that's not um, true. Uh, again, highlighting the coefficient levels are low. Now look at bullying, right? Bullying is an index um, comprised of different variables. Um, and here it shows an association of being a boy and having suffered bullying uh, at least uh, once a month, okay? So we can see the coefficients are actually higher than the other variables. Um, and definitely, bullying seems to affect uh, boys um, more than girls. Now, the other issue is, is there an association between the gender of the teacher, being a male or a female teacher, the student performance, and teachers' opinions, classroom, and professional behaviors? And we see that there is definitely an association between being a fame male teacher and having students with higher scores, okay? Uh, female teachers also tend to assign um, homework more often. Um, and there is an association between uh, being a female teacher and being in a school where the school actually emphasizes academic success. Um, five minutes? <laughs> so we're talking about uh, low job satisfaction and low degree of success in curriculum implementation. These are predominantly uh, associated with male teachers. So we built, uh, the next step in this analysis was to build a model to determine what some were the variables that predicted males and female scores. Whoa. I don't know what happened to the graphs, but okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll continue here. So basically, uh, what the graphs show is that in all GCC countries, the following were the most uh, strongest predictors of science scores for females and males um, when all other variables were controlled for. So the results here are very similar to the results presented earlier, but here the analysis was done separately for boys and for girls. So basically, how far in education a student wants to go, so going to tertiary or non-tertiary education, uh, is a better predictor for males than females in five out of six countries. Um, absence from school, being absent from school more than a month was a better predictor for females, also in five out of six countries. Um, confidence in science was a better predictor for males than females. And receiving extra science lessons for more months, uh, four or more months out of the year, were, uh, was a better predictor for males in Bahrain 
uh, a better predictor for females in Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, and uh, they made about the same contribution in the UAE, um, Qatar, and Oman. Now, there were some predictors that contributed to the model only for females and some only for males. Uh, one was for females, school SES, uh, in Kuwait and Qatar. Parents think science is important, was uh, particularly important for females in Kuwait. Being assigned homework at least three times a week um, in Oman, and bullying in Qatar. And the significant predictors for males only were the gender of the teacher, so male uh, students who had female teachers performed uh, better. Um, and being able to implement uh, the curriculum successfully, particularly in Bahrain. Do I have time to go over the policy options? <laughs> okay. So basically, unfortunately, the graphs, for some reason, they didn't work. But I think the message here is um, we do want to pr improve education. It's not just uh, for boys or for girls. We want to improve for both. But we need to take into consideration partic the particular needs um, of some boys. Um, and when we look uh, at the overall um, results, first, I think we need to stimulate them to pursue higher education degrees and to show the association between education and a successful life, not just a financially successful life, but a life that is um, uh, healthier and productive in general. And also, we need to increase the students' motivation to attend school. And um, many studies have shown that boys think that school is very boring. So I think we need to learn, particularly from the latest advances of neuroscience, to, which already determine that boys and girls learn differently, and sort of tailor the pre-service and service training of teachers' curriculum and methodologies to actually make school more interesting for boys uh, to stay in school. Um, and also increase the students' confidence in science and math using methodologies that have been proven and actually associated with higher performance, making classes more hands-on and making the connection between real life um, and science as a whole. Um, improve teacher satisfaction, and when there are financial incentives, to actually combine those with accountabilities uh, to make sure the curriculum is being implemented the way it is supposed to, and that what's happening in the classroom is actually meaningful for both boys and girls. And increase awareness about current school-based activities to, school, uh, to deter school violence and bullying. I think we need to look not just uh, in the UAE, UAE, but also to look in the region as a whole. There are sometimes small interventions that schools can benefit from, and they can actually be taken into account when developing policies. And not to forget um, also the needs of uh, low SES students, as we saw in the presentation yesterday, if you uh, deliver targeted in interventions, uh, such as remedial education, government-sponsored tutoring, et, et cetera, you can actually raise the scores um, of both boys and girls. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Burn, please go ahead. Oh, can I have the Good morning. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organization of the conference, the director of the Regional Center of Educational Planning, the Ministry of Education of the UAE, uh, for this invitation um, to present here in this conference. Um, the work Spain does uh, to promote the, the culture of assessment, and as the title of my presentation indicates, um, our public relations uh, strategies for the dissemination of international studies in Spain, international assessments. Just as important as the work we do, it is to let the world know what we do and to create this culture of assessment. So in this uh, presentation, uh, I will briefly start by talking about the, the organization I represent, 
and our responsibilities and move on to uh, present what are the means we use to influence and, and uh, make participate of, of evaluation of international assessments and our work to students, teachers, parents, decision makers, and society at large, okay? These are a number of the strategies that I will be talking about. Then after that, I will present some resources that we make available to, uh, to teachers and, and the educational community at large, once again, to promote this culture of assessment and evaluation uh, with a special focus on international assessments. And then I will finish by presenting a, a reflection on our performance on test results and the impact that those have had on teaching and learning, policy and system-wise, and I will conclude by um, a reflection on can we go a step further in terms of methodology and, and how we reflect on, on our teaching practice that will come at the very end. So, um, I work for the National Institute for Educational Evaluation, which I will refer as INE. Uh, our logo is there. We are a unit within the Ministry of Education, uh, Culture and Sport. Uh, of the government of Spain, and we are in charge of national and international assessments in Spain. We also oversee national and international indicators and the Journal of Education, which is a publication that comes out every three months with a variety of topics on, on education. So let me start by uh, briefly describing um, our administrative uh, structure in Spain. Uh, Spain is a highly decentralized country. We have 17 autonomous communities, as uh, they are labeled in our 1978 constitution. Uh, we're, we're a kingdom, and there is a central government. We are part of the central government, and, uh, and the Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sport, MECD, uh, as I will refer to. We oversee legislation, the basic structure of education, cooperation initiatives among the 17 uh, autonomous communities, and also international cooperation. Um, to clarify terms and, and make this a little simple, I will refer to uh, regional offices of education uh, to name uh, the 17 education departments of our autonomous communities, okay? Autonomous communities is the term that um, that was presented in our constitution, as I said, but I think if we stick to this term, ROEs, it will be a little easier to, to follow my presentation. So, central government, legislation, basic structure, cooperation initiatives, coordination among the regional offices of education. Regional offices of education are responsible for all other aspects in their respective territories. School management, curriculum implementation, and mostly financial and personal management. There you have uh, um, a map of Spain with the 17 regions and the 17 flags. Okay, so as I already anticipated, uh, we are responsible for national assessments and we coordinate uh, international evaluations. That is um, an infograph uh, presenting our system. I believe the next one will be much more uh, much more clear to you. So our national assessments take place in third grade, sixth grade, tenth grade, and also at the end of twelfth grade uh, in the form of a university uh, excellence examination. All right. Uh, when it comes to international assessments, we do participate in PISA. Uh, we participate in tallies as well, and for the first time in 2018 we are going to uh, participate in uh, uh, primary and secondary. And uh, we're also part of PIAC, PISA for Schools, which was mentioned yesterday I came out and came up in the conversation. And Teams, E-Teams in 2019, and PROS, which we're excited about uh, uh, to be presenting uh, next December uh, 2017. So, okay, just, just a quick snapshot about our results in Teams uh, 
2011 and 2015 and the evolution that we experienced between uh, 2011 and 2015. Uh, we were excited to see this growth and, and positive improvement. Um, when it comes to PISA, here, here you have all, all the cycles. Uh, we were excited as well in 2015 to see uh, the growth and, and improvement. Uh, for the first time, we're slightly above the OECD average in reading. Uh, we're the closest we've ever been to the OECD as well in math, slightly underneath, and at the same level uh, as the OECD in science. So, now, going into the um, promoting this culture of assessment, we take this very seriously, as, as I started uh, in the beginning. If we don't, if we're not ahead of the game and, and uh, become very proactive in, in promoting uh, international assessments and national assessments too, uh, people and teachers and um, um, the community in general are going to find out about these studies uh, through the press. And you know, these are going to not always emphasize the best results and, and the best um, aspects of our performance and, and even the nature of, of the international assessments itself. So we find that very often. It is the way it is and we all deal with the media. Uh, we know what it's like. So, first and foremost, uh, we promote this culture of uh, evaluation assessment among teachers, students, families and, and society in general. Uh, within our own Ministry of Education, uh, when, I, when I first started working with, within the ministry and, and the team of international of, of assessment, uh, it, really, it really struck me how, how, how important it is to even promote and, and advertise these studies within uh, the ministry itself and the regional offices of education. At times, outside of our teams, uh, there's not a clear understanding of what we do. And we're all part of the same structure, the same organization. So we've become very active in, in promoting this knowledge uh, within our own ministry. And then the educational community at large. Okay, these are all the methods I will be talking about very briefly. I promise I won't go on and on, but you know, there are a variety of resources, conferences, uh, our web page is very active, workshops, our blog, periodical journals, a YouTube channel, our Twitter, um, many of them. So, first of all, we have our YouTube channel, okay, where we upload any presentation we're, we're part of or, or that is kind of related to this topic of um, assessment and could be of interest to the community. We are very active in our Twitter account. Uh, we've noticed that a lot of people who follow uh, assessments and international assessments uh, are Twitter followers. So uh, a group of us within INE are devoted to creating uh, a number of tweets per week, whether those are informational, very general, about different uh, uh, aspects relating assessment, or creating the momentum for any study that's coming up or, or any, any, any release that is, is becoming, is happening within the near future. For example, uh, Pearl's 2016, the results will be published uh, December 5th. So we're already uh, very actively uh, informing about that. We're going to present the encyclopedia within the next few days. The frameworks are there already. Um, just to name PISA or, or TELIS. Um, we're very active about promoting the PISA in focus, teaching in focus, also the politics of the IEA, uh, the policy briefs. Uh, 
we have all those translated into Spanish and posted in our website. So every time we upload any of those, uh, we make sure we send out some tweets. We find that a very useful and, and beneficial strategy, and, and we get a lot of positive feedback from the re regional offices of education uh, because it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a very easy way to advertise a lot of the work or the, 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 the work that's related to what we do. Our website, if you go into our website, which will be posted on the, on the last slide, uh, we have it, we have all the information about our different activities in a very organized way, and that helps people understand what we do uh, very easily. So um, I would suggest that's a good strategy. So national reports, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure you all do the same, but that is a big part of our, of our responsibilities. Uh, beyond the international reports that come with every study, we work on very detailed national reports. Right now, we are working on the Pearls 2016 report. As, as you, you will know, we received um, a few weeks ago uh, all the data and information. We're, we're now working on the Spanish report, which will be released and presented uh, also on December 5th. Um, I'll talk about this later on in the, in the presentation, but uh, the level of support we received from the minister and the secretary of state for education all the way down and all across the, the ministry is, is huge. Usually they're there in, in the presentations of these reports or when it comes to talking about this, these results. Okay. Uh, these are, the, I was exactly talking about this, report launches. We do not only write the reports uh, that contain a lot of you know, information regarding you know, the international report and the one that's uh, relevant uh, for Spain and, and the different regions. Uh, we also create these report launches. A lot of these take place in Madrid, of course, because that's where we are based and that's what makes everything easier on, on our end, but we've also had a number of, of off-site um, presentations, okay? Uh, on the picture in the bottom, you'll see the director, uh, Dr. Carmen Tobar, and also uh, the head of the data analysis department, Dr. Javier Garcia Crespo, my, my colleagues. Okay. Newsletters. Okay. Let me, let me talk about this. So, I already talked about the, the, our Twitter account, which is very active, about two or three tweets every day, presenting different topics. Uh, we have a monthly newsletter where, where uh, in about four to six pages, we present information about, uh, once again, uh, something, some topic that is relevant about our, our work. Uh, once again, because we're about to, to come up with the results of, of PEARLS, our uh, upcoming newsletters will be regarding different aspects of, of PEARLS. We also uh, create a weekly uh, blog entry, uh, which we also generate in-house. That's, that's relatively brief, about four or 500 words, but again, those are about different, different topics of, of our work. Just uh, making the public aware of what we do and, and the significance of, of these studies. So, so as you see, we devote a lot of time and, and resources to, to promoting uh, this type of work. So, working papers, uh, well, working papers are connected to uh, the visiting uh, teachers and the scholars programs. Uh, because of all the database and all the information we have, uh, Occasionally, we'll have visitors who stay with us for one week or, or two weeks working directly with us. Uh, typically, they're, um, uh, they're uh, students finishing their, their doctoral work. And, and what we ask them to do after the time they spent with us is that they create some sort of paper that we can uh, post in our website uh, with information about their study, but also uh, about one of our, one of our uh, studies and, and projects going on. 
All right, this is the visiting program for teachers and scholars I was talking about. You'll be able to see about that in, in our website. Uh, we do believe that it is important to foster collaboration between teachers, researchers, scholars, and our institution and the Ministry of Education, of course. Okay? So that's why we, uh, we work directly with uh, universities and higher education institutions. Okay, also, um, in all our activities, report launches and professional development activities for teachers that I will talk about in a second, uh, we try to uh, bring some speakers and presenters from the IEA and the OECD because uh, we believe that's a great way to, uh, to get teachers closer to this, uh, to this type of assessments and, and studies. Once you put a face to these organizations, uh, you break a little bit of the barrier uh, that, that may exist, okay? So, what are, what are some of the resources that we make available to schools uh, through our work? Well, I, I will present um, some of these. We do believe that if there is any change or, or if anyone is going to uh, make things change in education, it is going to be teachers. So, it is our priority to impact teachers and, and the work they do and their beliefs and, and their, their thoughts about these studies. So how do we reach out to them? By a number, by, by a number of conferences and workshops, by released resources, working papers we've talked about, the visiting program, education inspectors uh, I will refer to a little bit later. Um, it is very important to create um, positive synergies and, and to have a constant communication with the 17 regional offices of education. Uh, we have periodical meetings with the assessment teams from all the regional offices of education. They come to Madrid about every other month and we have very technical, very uh, detailed discussions about where we are in terms of these assessments, uh, where we're headed to, and, and most importantly, what they need from us and, and how we can, we can help them, because um, otherwise uh, this is not gonna work in, in a highly decentralized country as, as we are. Also, um, just, just to, to name another aspect, uh, future principals and school administrators in Spain have to go through uh, a rigorous uh, training. Uh, a part of this training, uh, beyond the, the traditional topics of you know, students with special needs, uh, uh, students from uh, diverse um, uh, language and cultural uh, backgrounds. Uh, a, part, a part of the content of this uh, professional development and training is um, national and international assessments, okay? It is, it is very important that the, the person and the team who, who will be in charge of the building are familiar with these studies and, and the the relevance of, of these studies. Okay, so as I already mentioned, we're committed to uh, teachers and schools and, and how to help them benefit uh, the most and the best they can from all these studies. Okay, uh, we have a number of conferences and workshops going on during the year, five minutes? Okay, thanks. Um, the most successful ones have been the ones where we've presented uh, the released items of the different studies, uh, presented the frameworks, and then uh, part, part of the, the day or the two days that were devoted um, to, this type, to this type of workshops, we had teachers creating uh, their own items, okay? Once they were presented, when the release items and the frameworks, it was very important to, to put them to work and see what it takes to generate this, uh, these sort of items. And it, gets them, it gives them a better understanding of, of, um, of what these studies entail, okay? Um, summer courses for teachers are a great opportunity. During the month of July, the Ministry of Ed funds uh, a, a very large and extensive program for, of professional development for teachers, and a number of those 
are always devoted to international assessments, okay? The last ones we had this last July in Santander and La Coruña uh, were about um, the first one, Keys to Improve Education, which uh, had to do with uh, educational policy and what international assessments reveal, and then the challenge of science, which we've been talking about extensively here uh, in, in, uh, in this conference. All right. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll move on, release resources. You, you know, it's, it's a great tool to get to the teachers. Institutional support, uh, I already mentioned the, the significance of this direct communication with the regional offices of education and their assessment teams. Uh, uh, teachers, uh, the professional development for principals and future school administrators, education inspectors. This is a body of, of civil servants, you know, public employees in Spain, uh, former teachers and former principals and, and uh, school administrators who oversee a number of schools and oversee mostly uh, curriculum and personnel management. Uh, but with, uh, with the newest uh, uh, law implementation, the 2013 uh, Organic Law uh, um, for, the, for the Improvement of the Quality of Education, uh, part of the responsibility was also working with schools and working in, in the system, uh, reflecting on international assessments. So, uh, a little bit of a reflection on, on scores and the impact it's had on teaching and learning. Well, uh, there's a long tradition in international studies in Spain. We started uh, with PISA in year 2000, but, but the most recent impact has been the one that uh, the law of 2013 had. Okay, the preamble of, of this law uh, established the rationale and, and a deep analysis of international studies and, and that has transpired to every aspect of, of, of the daily teaching of, of teachers in, in Spain, okay? Uh, here is, uh, again, our improvement in, in international assessments. In the, last, uh, in the last cycles of PISA and, and teams, but what this legal change has entailed for Spain is, has been a curriculum simplification. Uh, for a long time, we talk about basic competencies, minimum contents to be achieved, and evaluation criteria. After 2013, we've evolved to um, a, a, different, a different approach where we've defined standards and we've re reinforced competencies focusing on, uh, on key competencies, okay? We've reinforced the level of school autonomy and, and the autonomy of, of principals and administrators overseeing school, and very importantly, um, we've created, we have in place a system of national assessment uh, whose uh, frameworks and scales and, and rationale mirrors the one of international assessments. Ours take place in third, sixth, and, and tenth grade. They're diagnostic and, and formative. They're standard-based, competence-based, and, and very transparent, okay? Uh, we don't do any school ranks either. And uh, to, to finish with, uh, I would like to bring to the table uh, a little reflection that the results of Teams and PISA have uh, brought about in Spain. Uh, we've noticed in the results of the last few years that there is an increasing interest in science and technology on the students. Uh, there is also an increasing awareness now of the gender gap in, in this interest. And we're transitioning in this methodological change to a more comprehensive approach. I'm sure you've all heard about STEM, STEAM, and STREAM maybe. What does this mean? This means that uh, uh, traditionally we've been, focused, we've been focused on a more convergent type of thinking uh, when planning our lessons and implementing the curriculum. Uh, we believe the key that to make in this change is promoting a divergent type of thinking, okay? Uh, that stems from a constant methodological reflection and analysis, okay? I'll pass on the scores and, and graphs. So, why STEAM? Step further from um, STEM, because Arts um, 
help foster those abilities that uh, we try to uh, we try to inside uh, through, through STEM. Arts really teach. And well, this is an interesting in infograph from the University of Florida, where you see that the the, the function, the right main functions, okay, spatial abilities, facial recognition, art and music, emotion, creativity, enhance uh, the qualities that are located in the left side of our brain, which are the traditional STEM ones, uh, math, logic, you know, analytical, okay. Arts enhance the skills and competencies that are necessary for science. So STEM cannot just be STEM. We, we need to move in the direction of STEAM and pursue these this other, this other competencies, okay? But you can go a step further even and talk about STREAM because a lot of emphasis is placed on uh, Reading, so that cannot be left out in the equation, okay? So reading and writing should be a part of this uh, methodological uh, consideration. Here is some information about divergent thinking, uh, di uh, convergent thinking, traditional way of teaching, uh, one question, one expected answer. Uh, let's move away from that. And, and, and teach in a way where we're presenting our students with many possible answers, okay? Where there's no only one way to respond and to react to things. And well, taking this a step further, uh, now there are those voices who talk about stream and are emphasizing the importance of also physical activity and, and sports as a part of this more holistic and, and humanistic approach to teaching, if you will. Okay, so uh, some, these are my conclusions for this presentation. Uh, as you've seen, we are very proactive about working in the promotion of the culture of evaluation, and, and we take very seriously being very public and, and, and very transparent about it. Uh, we do believe that no success uh, will be achieved without the involvement of all the stakeholders and the educational community uh, within our own organizations or the external support. Once again, no change will be brought about without the support and work of teachers and the involvement of them. Policy changes need to happen. These have come up a few times during the presentations of all the, the speakers. Um, you see some of the results of our um, scores in, in Teams and, and PISA. And uh, I would say uh, it's time for a paradigm shift and, and a more humanistic and holistic approach, more, more global type of learning and teaching. Thank you so much. And uh, here is our website and our email account for any information. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bernay. Let me start with you since you're fresh from uh, okay. coming from there. Do you hold ceremonies uh, uh, for schools who performed well and all that, or uh, you consider a type of a more commercial for the school? I mean. Yeah, we, we're a very social country, but we, we don't have a tradition of celebrating these sort of ceremonies. Uh, it's just been recently, for example, that, that uh, there have been graduating ceremonies at, at, the, at the end of high school uh, for, for high schools in Spain, but that's something that I was see. just okay. not part of our culture. Okay, during your career, I noticed uh, uh, the, uh, the students getting involved in the community service. Would yes. you elaborate on that? What, what is that? Well, um, Community service projects, you know. Community that. service projects is um, anything that is related to school, but, um, but goes beyond the, the academic and, and the hours of instruction and the traditional disciplines. Community service, uh, uh, and that's been my journey, and, and that's been one of my passions uh, as a teacher in, in, in a classroom for over 10 years, is, is any opportunity where, where students and schools can give back to the community and, and contribute and, and, and make a difference. 
I have found uh, in, in my experience, and this is not directly related to international assessments, but, but I do believe it, 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 it brings about the best in the students. So what I have found over the years is that the, these sort of projects really um, help teachers um, look at students in a different way and bring about the best in them. So a lot of those kids who are in your class and, and go unnoticed and they're not necessarily the best students mm -hmm. and could be the most troubled students you have, they excel and sign in any of these projects. Uh, my favorite community service project, which I ran for a number of years, was the uh, Teachers for the Day, where I took a number of high school students to uh, our uh, feeder elementary schools in the area, and we took over the school. Uh, teachers, elementary school teachers, didn't, didn't teach for the day, and it was our kids who were in the classroom being teachers. Uh, how many times have I been so gladly surprised, and, and again, those kids who would go and notice and, and, and you know, uh, you wouldn't think are, are, are the most uh, motivated would just shine and, and be rock stars that day. So Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Rochelle, there are more uh, female in the room here, you know, than, than male, so I should, I should be very uh, careful on what I say. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, I took the PISA results of the UAE, and instead of uh, being four levels, okay, I made it seven levels, mm -hmm. okay? The, so 600 and above is level one, and then 300 and below is the worst one, that's, uh, okay? Uh, when I d did the gender gap uh, thing, uh, I, that simple analysis of variance between male and female. Okay, the highest, uh, g the top group, F male are significantly better than female. The second one, male significantly better than female. Third one, male better than female, but not significantly. And then the females start taking over. So really, I, f I feel it is not fair to take the whole thing and say female better than male. Mm -hmm. What do you say about that? Okay. <laughs> I think your results actually are similar to results that I've seen in some other countries. When you look at the top, the very top, it's usually mostly um, males. But here we are talking about uh, equity of education, right? So basically, we want um, the, the students who are at the bottom to perform better. And when we look at the overall results, and when we look at the overall conditions of schools, particularly boys' schools, um, we see that there is a lot of room for improvement. So I think that's the... So I am biased. <laughs> that's okay. the idea. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, any questions from the floor, Dr. Taysir? Any mic? شكرا آه المعذره بدي احكي بالانجليزي شوي اذا في مجال تفضل اي وود لايك تو ريكاب اون ذا كويشن يو هاف اسك دكتور مسعود ان تيرمز اوف جندر جاب ديفينتلي اي توتالي اجري وذ يو ذات وي شود اكزامين جندر جاب باي فيريس ليفلز اوف بيرفورمانس نوت ذا اوفر اول بيكتشر بس ذات دوزنت مين ذات اي مين لوكينج تو ذا اوفر اول I mean, it's not important. It's important because we are talking about system in terms of education. The old explanation for what you have said is that uh, female uh, scores in achievement are more homogeneous than male scores on any dimension which means that male scores are more heterogeneous. That's why you will find more males in the upper end of the distribution, but at the same time, you will find also more males in the lower side of the distribution itself, while female scores are tend to be more homogeneous. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Please. Thank you very much. 
I'm also going to speak in English for, for this. I, I would like to, to comment about the assessment and evaluation. Okay. Part of our um, problem in this region is uh, most of the system are using the summative ev evaluation for the students, which is using summative evaluation in, a, in addition to comparing students where we, we stigmatize students. They are low achievers, they are high achievers. And the problem now, I think, these results that is attained by the education system, which is low in some of these subjects, it is because of this. I think I saw that you have mentioned about diagnostic formative assessment, which I can also add, it is di diagnostic continuous formative assistance. Continuous meaning that the teacher should not wait for a certain period to try to assess the students, but I think he can do it, he or, can, he or she can, can do it in a daily basis or after each section in order to try to, as a remedy, so, so he can try to treat the students who see that they are a bit, bit low achiever in order to take them to balance other students, but without um, announcing and stigmatizing the students. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Right. Yes. Uh, very, very good question. You're right, we talk about diagnostic, continuous, uh, formative. You know, it's easy to get lost in all that terminology and, and make it all sound, uh, you know, very big and, and very serious. Um, yes, I t totally agree. I, I missed on the continuous evaluation part, but, but that's, that, that's part of our daily life as, as teachers. Um, evaluation happens through a number of formal and, and informal ways. And, and, and that's part of our culture of assessment and the idea we're, we're trying to, to promote, uh, left and right and, and, and constantly. Um, the fact that we're having uh, um, national assessments now, um, or that we participate in, in international assessments, um, does, not, um, does not mean any school or any student is gonna be better or worse. Uh, I've been very explicit about the no school ranks, um, so we, we kind of we're trying to stay away from from all that, uh, and that's why we're again trying to be I, ahead I of the game. I intentionally wanted to bring this question because we do it here over here, and yeah. no one in the world does it. Okay, so no, it's it's just uh, if you remember that that was part of the uh, beginning of my presentation. We, we try to be ahead of ahead of the game and. And, and create the, the headlines we would like for, for the press, because if we wait for them to, to come up with the headlines, uh, chances are we're not gonna look that good, <laughs> and, and uh, that school ranks are, are gonna happen. Um, uh, no school rank of any sort is, 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 uh, exists in, in Spain. The way information is treated by others, we don't know. And even all the schools that were, uh, participate in, in PISA for schools, uh, there's not rank about that. So, so yeah, I would say uh, staying ahead of the game, staying ahead of the press, and, and creating the culture of formal and informal assessment, and, and they're not exclusive or, 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 or unique for specific moments in, in, in the school year. It, they all happen naturally. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, I thank everyone for coming, and uh, I blame uh, our chief, uh, Mahra al Mutayoui, for telling us to shorten this because this should have gone forever. Okay, this is so rich. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, Anne. أدعو الأخوة والأخوات الحضور للاستراحة لمدة عشرين دقيقة وشكرا